stage set the sound and lights ablaze if that's the measure that it takes to crush the idols jerk the pews and all the decorations too until the congregation's few and has revival Just be hopeful, cause you can sing all you want to, you can sing all you want to, you can sing all you want to, and still Take a break from all the plans that you have made and sit alone at home and wait for God to whisper. Beg him please to open up his mouth and speak and pray for real upon your knees until they blister. Shine the Cause anything I put before my God is an idol. And anything I love with all my heart is an idol. And anything. Take a break from all the plans that I have made. I'll sit alone at home and wait for you to whisper. I'm begging, please, Lord, open up your mouth and speak. I'll pray for real upon my knees until they blister. Please shine your light on every corner of my life until my pride and lust and lies are in the open. I'll read your word and put to test the things I've heard until my heart and soul are stirred and rocked and broken.
Be it for me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea, and this mountain.
everything for the wife who feels betrayed the child who is afraid for the home that is broken by the scars of sin and shame there is hope and there is healing in the power of jesus name there is the truth that makes us free. There's forgiveness and cleansing at the cross of Calvary.
All right, how about now? Oh, yeah, we're hot. All right, so good to have you here this morning. We know it is a warm and toasty day, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, the passage we're going to look at this morning in John chapter 6, I, I, just a thought I want you to dwell on this morning, and I want to say this before we even get started, I know who I'm talking to. I am talking to a group of people who in one of the hottest days of the summer came out to sit under a farm, a tent, for a service on Sunday. But a thought I want us to consider that really Jesus asked to his disciples and for it to be on our hearts and minds for us to really wrestle with and consider uh, this Lord's Day is, what will it take for you to quit? What, what will it take for you to quit on the Lord? <laughs> right? Not 102. It's got to be 103. Uh, uh, Lord, Lord willing, uh, you'll have the same response that Peter had. And Peter's response was, to whom shall we go? Where else are we going to go? There's, there's no person, no place better than in your presence. And that's where we want to be this morning. We want to be in the presence of the Lord. This isn't uh, just about us being together. This is about us spending a few moments uh, worshiping the Lord together, fellowshipping together, but being in his presence and learning from him and growing in him. Now, before we get into the singing this morning, there are a few things I want you to know about and be aware of and to be in prayer for. Uh, this morning, and, and we've been praying for this for quite some time, uh, this morning, John Hawkins uh, passed away. Uh, Kathy's, Kathy's husband, we've been praying for that for quite some time. Uh, the past couple of days, as many of you know, a couple weeks ago, they took him up to, uh, uh, to, to have uh, therapy, physical therapy up in Wilsonville, and that really did not go well. And uh, she actually just brought him home. And in reality, when, when I talked to her and she's bringing him home, she said, I, I'm, I'm bringing him home to die, really. I mean, she didn't say, she just knew that was going to be the case. He wasn't going to last uh, real long. And over the past couple of days, uh, his stomach started rejecting everything. His kidneys began to shut down, and she could just see the process was really beginning, that his body was just starting to shut down. And so uh, she, I spoke to her briefly this morning, and, uh, and so John passed away, and... Um, he was a military man, so he'll be uh, buried up there at uh, Lamont National, I believe is what it is there up in, uh, in Portland. And so she's got a lot of those things already planned, and, uh, and, and so thankful for that. But just be in prayer for her. I, knowing Kathy, I, I know this, knowing Kathy, she would actually probably appreciate some of you uh, reaching out to her via a phone call or a text or something like that, and just let her know that you're praying for her. She's, you know, she's uh, if she could, she'd love to give all of you a, probably a hug right now is what she would like to do. Many of you know her that way. And so I'm sure she would love to hear from you. If you'd reach out to her and speak to her, write her a letter, give her a phone call, uh, a text message, something like that. I know that she would like uh, to hear that. Also be in prayer for just a few other people as well. Uh, I know this weekend, I think uh, Hope and, and Daniel's mom, Cheryl, are traveling over to Idaho and, and back, I think this weekend, uh, Azariah. Uh, the Millers, they're traveling down to California and back. And so a few people that are gone traveling. So pray for them. Keep them in your prayers as well. Um, so before we go to the Lord in prayer, we don't usually do this on a Sunday morning, but any other pressing prayer requests that need to be mentioned uh, before we go to the Lord uh, in prayer? I don't know if there are or not, but I want to give you an opportunity because I know we don't always have this opportunity to do that. Um, just to praise for me. It's great to have many of you probably saw my dad here this morning. Um, so glad to have him here visiting with us, and uh, he's back there in the back, and so be sure to see him and greet him. I know many of you enjoy uh, talking to him when he's here, so thankful that he's got here safely and leaving safely, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow, um, but uh, thankful for that. Let's start with a word of prayer that Terry's going to come and lead us in some singing uh, this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to meet together, uh, Lord, even under these unusual circumstances uh, Lord, as the song we're about to sing in just a moment, our desire is to, is to behold our God and to look into his word. And when we do those things, when we see our God for who he is and we see his word and what it instructs us to do, that our desire is to follow him. We'll follow him to the ends of the world and, to, and through everything. Lord, he's walked, we know that you've walked with us through the most difficult moments of our lives. And Lord, we we would never want to, I pray our hearts will never uh, have a desire to abandon you uh, because you've been good to us and because uh, you are faithful. And um, Lord, who else are we going to go to? Lord, in this world, 
we know that there are many people that are searching for loads of answers, that are searching for relief, that are searching for peace. And Lord, may we never be a people that um, wander from you looking for it somewhere else. But may we say like, Peter, Lord, to whom, whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living, uh, the son of God. Lord, Lord, who else are we going to go to? Lord, may we continually on a regular basis come back to you as our source of life and our source of hope and our source of joy uh, and our source of stability in uncertain times. Uh, Lord, as our theme was for this year and will continue to be in these uncertain times, when every time we turn on the news, we look somewhere else, that something seems uncertain, something seems dangerous, something seems threatening, uh, Lord, that our eyes won't turn down in despair, but Lord, that they'll turn upward uh, to look to you, knowing that you have the answer, and Lord, that you are going to do what is good and what is right, and as we learn through the book of Esther, that you are sovereignly in control. And so, Lord, more, may we continue to lean on you and trust in you more and more. And Lord, may this morning be an opportunity for us to strengthen that commitment even more. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in our brief time together today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I encourage you, if you're able to, to stand together with us this morning. We're just going to sing two songs before uh, we get to God's word. But again, one of those is our theme song for this year, Behold Our God. And then the other one is Ancient Words. Maybe you have a copy of it uh, printed out or on your phone. But if you're able to, stand together with us. Terry, come lead us in singing uh, this morning. Behold our God, who has held the oceans in his hand, who has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice.
One of the great things about our Lord is that though he reigns far above all else, um, there's an immeasurable gap between him and us in terms of time and space, yet he has chosen to reveal himself to us, uh, unique among all the gods of this world that he has given us, his word. Let's sing about it together. Ancient words. <laughs> give an attentive ear and heart as pastor brings that ancient word to us. Let me turn my mic on here. The book of John uh, chapter 6 and we're going to finish out John chapter 6 and as we start this morning uh, I want us to take just a minute and we're going to read verses 60 through 71. A lot of times as we walk through these chapters, we'll just go verse by verse and won't read the entire context in one time, in one sitting. But let's do that this morning, verses 60 through 71. Beginning in verse 60, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, of Jesus' disciples, when they'd heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father." From that, uh, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? 
Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. As I said before I even started the service this morning, the thought that I want you to dwell on for just a moment is what will it take for you to quit? Let's bow our heads together this morning in prayer before we jump into the message this morning. Dear Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity to meet again. Lord, we thank you that we can turn to you and behold you for who you are. We're so thankful, as Terry mentioned, that even though you are so far above us and so, more, so, so far uh, smarter than us and wiser than us and greater than us and more powerful than us and above us in every single possible way, Lord, you still desire to commune with us. You still desire to fellowship with us. You still desire to work in us. You still desire a relationship with us. And you have spoken to us through your word. And so, Lord, over these next few moments, I pray that you'll help us to focus on you and your word and not anything else, but to give you, not me, but you, the proper worship to ascribe worth to you by giving you our attention and our hearts and our minds and our lives. Lord, not just to worship you in this moment, but to worship you with our lives day by day. And Lord, we'll thank you for the work that you do in us today through your word and through your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. How many of you have heard the statement, uh, you can kind of tell a lot about a person by what, what it takes to make them quit? How, how far uh, they, can, they can go. You can learn a lot about somebody's character uh, based upon those things. In the, in the current climate, one of the really interesting things that has happened, and, and please understand, and I think most of you, if you're a regular pioneer, know that we've just been going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, section by section. So it wasn't, please understand, I didn't say, oh, let's go here, let's talk about this this morning. This is just where we land as we are moving through the text this morning. So please, uh, uh, if, if, by the way, if this is personal for you, understand I wasn't watching your life and writing these notes out. If it feels really personal and convicting, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, but I also want you to understand I'm not, I'm not preaching this this morning to, to necessarily call people out that aren't here this morning. But I do want us to understand this is not just with Pioneer. There is an epidemic that is going around uh, churches today that people and churches and pastors are finding out what it takes for people to quit. And, and under the current, uh, the current circumstances in our country, there are many people, unfortunately, that have walked away from the church and have zero intention of coming back and, or have, have enjoyed the comforts of being able to, uh, you know, to, watch, uh, to watch services online that they've really struggled to, to come back. And, and I, as I've said before, you know, people that maybe uh, have underlying health issues or struggles with those kinds of things, I'm not talking about those kinds of things, but what I'm talking about is the kind of people who they'll go to the stores and they'll go out to eat and they'll go visit with family and friends and all these different kinds of people. But when it comes to Sunday, they struggle to say, oh, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I want to go. I, don't, I just don't know about those, those kinds of things. And, and even more sad to me is it seems like over the last about year or so, it seems like like every couple of months, there's somebody else that's coming out who was, who was well-known in Christendom, whether it was a musician or a book writer or whatever the case may be, who it seems like almost every couple of months, somebody is coming out that says, you know what, I've left the faith. I don't believe in Jesus Christ anymore. Uh, some of them will say, you know, I believe that there's a God. I just don't know enough about him yet. I just don't know if what the Bible says is true. And what's happening is we're starting to see more and more what it takes for people to quit. Now, in the context of John chapter 6, we have to understand what was going on. The crowd has been following Jesus around. He fed five, the 5,000 not too long ago. They track him across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus really calls them out uh, about, uh, about why they're following him. You're, you're following me because I fed 5,000 people, because I turned the five loaves and two fishes into food. You're not really here to even see anything else. You're not even here to hear my message. You're just here hoping possibly that I make another meal, a free meal. You can get a free lunch out of this. And they were not happy that Jesus has called them out on this. And Jesus looked at him again. I mean, this is kind of a recap from last week. And he says, hey, this food that you're eating physically will not, will not satisfy you forever. The bread 
bread that I'm offering to you, uh, you could live forever. You could have eternal life if you partake of this living bread. Jesus did not water down the message. Uh, He looks these people in the eyes and says, you did not come here for the right reasons. The only reason you're here is you're hoping to get a free meal. But if you're going to make it to heaven, if you're going to have eternal life, you have to have faith in me. You have to partake in me. And we talked last week about how so many people sometimes view Jesus as this weak person that you can just kind of walk all over him and make him whatever you want him to be. But Jesus clearly in the text we looked at, la- looked at last week said, no, no, no. If you're going to get to heaven and you're going have, to have faith, it's going to be this way. It's my way or the highway. There aren't a whole bunch of different ways. There's one way. It's this way. You have to partake of me. And I just want us to understand that as Jesus is preaching this message, he knows, right? He knows what the repercussions to that message is going to be. He knows what's going to happen. At this point, there are thousands of people that are following him around the area. And he knows that in the preaching of this message, there will be people that leave. Look again at verse 60. It says this, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, When they heard the message that Jesus preached, when he said, I'm the living bread, you have to partake of me. When he said, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. They said this, uh, when they heard this said, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? In other words, they, they look around and go, man, he really stepped on our toes. Like that's really difficult to take in. I, I believe they were saying it was both intellectually hard to process But I also think it was very difficult for them to willfully accept what Jesus had said. Understand that so many of these Jews had lived their life by following the law and tracking with the law and doing all of these things and and listening to Abraham and Moses and following them, you know, every jot and tittle and all those kinds of things. And Jesus finally comes along and says, listen, eternal life isn't about all the things you can do. Eternal life is about partaking in me. And they said, man, that, that really is difficult for us to both process, but it's also difficult for us to accept because it kind of goes against a lot of the things that we've grown up uh, knowing. What, you know what's happening here? They are wrestling in their souls. There's a, there's a struggle that's going on in their soul. And by the way, let me say this. Every once in a while, preaching should make you do that. It should make you wrestle in your soul a little bit. It should make you think and wrestle with the truth. Uh, And so what do they do? They're sitting here wrestling. They're wrestling with the truth that Jesus Christ has told them. And what's the decision that they decide to do? They decide to leave. That was their decision. That's what it took for them to quit. You know, as I sit here this morning, I must admit, even as a, as a pastor and a preacher, it is, when you stop and think about it, it is kind of funny sometimes when you think about how churches operate. And there are thousands, if not millions of people around the world right now, just like we are, sitting here. And for 30 or 40 minutes, don't worry, mine, I timed it a couple times. It's around 25 this morning. Uh, just let, let somebody stand up front of them and yell at them and scream at them and preach at them. The Bible refers to it at times as the foolishness of preaching. The world would certainly call it that. Like, you really spend your Sunday mornings doing that? Don't you realize you could sleep in or you could go eat brunch or, hey, the football, not this year. I was about to say football's coming on, but not this year, at least not yet. Uh, but you know, there's all these other things that could, uh, that could be happening. Uh, but these people, they hear the preaching of God's word and they leave. That's what it took for them to leave. Let me say this. I think there are good reasons to leave a church. Um, there aren't a whole lot of good reasons, but I do believe that there are some good reasons. And let me say this as well. I understand who I'm talking to. I understand that now at about four and a half years of Pioneer, that many of the people of Pioneer have previous church experiences that have left those churches and come here. I want to say this. I believe what we have at Pioneer is the Lord's doing. And I'm thankful for what he has done. And I'm glad that each and every single one of you are here and are part of Pioneer. I want to make that abundantly clear. I think there are loads of wrong reasons to leave a church. I think there's some good reasons. Um, I mean, just practically, uh, you know, it would make sense for somebody to go to a church that's closer than them than the ones that are further away. I mean, there's some practical reasons. 
Uh, there are also some other reasons like uh, doctrinal compromise. If you realize that they're just drifting away from the truth of God's word, that's a good reason to leave a church. If there's open immorality there, I think it's a good reason to leave a church. I also think there's loads of bad reasons to leave a church. Um, you know, I, I, di I didn't like that message that he preached this morning, or this church is just getting too big. And can I just say, if, if we ever have that view, the church is getting too big, I'm just going to tell you, you're probably not going to like heaven a lot because there's going to be a lot of people there worshiping the Lord uh, together. Um, some people say, well, you know, I, I don't like that church anymore because I don't agree with everything that they do. Can I tell you something? I've been the pastor of Pioneer Baptist Church for four and a half years, and I don't agree with everything I did. There, there are times I made decisions and I look back and go, that was dumb. Why did I do that? Why did we make that choice? Uh, and so, by the way, you're, you're in, uh, I don't know if I'm counted as good company or bad company, but you're in my company. If you look and go, oh, I didn't agree with everything, you know, that they did. I, I, I'm not sure I do either. Um, you know, sometimes we'll hear people say, oh, you know, just my needs aren't being, aren't being uh, met. Um, or sometimes you hear this one, they offended me. And the reality is with human beings, sinful human beings, I, and I've told you this before, we will be offended. Somebody's going to say something, it may be me, it may, maybe somebody else, that you're going to be offended. And as a matter of fact, that is what the people said here that Jesus did in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Have you been offended? The answer is sure. Yes, we've been offended. But Jesus also lays out the right way for us to deal with things when our feelings are hurt or when we're offended. And can I tell you, the right way to deal with them is not just to walk away, to leave. The right way to deal with them is to go to that person and do whatever you can to make it right. But this is what's happening here. Jesus has preached. They have been offended. Their, he their feelings were hurt, and then they left. Again, look at verse 61. It says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? I think it's really interesting when these people are getting ready to leave. When they're getting ready to leave the ministry of Jesus, they're walking out the door. They're not going to be there anymore. Notice what they wanted to do, what accompanied them leaving. The Bible says when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured. They murmured. They started to complain. They're fixing to leave, but they're certainly not going to do it biblically. They're going to start to murmur. I've come to the realization that many people that walk away from Jesus, many people that walk away from uh, the gospel, many people that walk away even from the local church, oftentimes they don't like to do it quietly. They, they, they don't like to do it sweetly. Um, I understand that at times people's feelings are hurt. And I understand that at times toes are stepped on. And I, as I said before, I even understand that there are times legitimate reasons to leave. Um, but there are many people that when they do it, they're going to leave and they want everybody to know. They want everybody to know. And they want everybody to know the reasons why. And they want to carry on and they want to make a big deal about it. I believe there is a right way and a wrong way to leave. And let me just say very clearly, murmuring is not the right way. Complaining is not the right way. Now, I, I typically consider myself, and, I, and, and so I understand I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tinted in this way. I typically consider myself to be a fairly positive person. I like to look on the bright side of things. I like to hear the positive sides of things. And so me personally, I really don't, I, I can't stand to hear people's constant complaining and murmuring. And, 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 and so I'm glad you're here. And I hope you're glad you're here. But I do want you to understand that the church that you're part of is not responsible for the sins of your ch past church experiences or ministry experiences. Um, and some people are still struggling with something that happened to them years ago. And part of the reason is because you haven't stopped talking about it. You haven't stopped talking about it and sharing it with other people and dealing with it with other people uh, if you're going to leave someplace, don't murmur your way out of it. And by the way, don't murmur your way into another place. I love this church. And I've loved churches that I've been a part of in the past. 
But the last thing I want to do is go, you know what, I love this church. It's nothing like the church I went to before. Let me tell you about all of their issues and all of their problems. I know this much. I don't want my children to grow up in a church where all they hear about are people's bad church experiences. I don't want, I don't, you know what I want? I want my kids to grow up in a church where they hear about people's great church experiences and great experiences of how the Lord uh, worked in somebody's life and, and, and desire that for themselves. I need to learn personally to live my life not on what somebody else did to me, but on what God is doing in me right now. Jesus looks at them again in verse 61 and he says, doth this offend you? Are you convicted? Are, are you, is this hard for you? And let me say this as well. Uh, it's not hard teaching when you yield to it. It's hard teaching when you resist it. When you, when you push against it. To some extent, I believe that the Bible isn't doing its, uh, and I hate, I'm not, putting, I'm not putting the onus on the Bible. So understand that when I say this. Sometimes, to some extent, the Bible isn't doing its job if it doesn't offend you. I mean, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. The reality is to be stuck by a sword does not feel good. It hurts. It's painful. It can be offensive. And I've realized that if God's word offends my heart, I have to ask myself, if God's word offends my heart, is that because God's word is out of line or because I'm out of line? So often we think that if our feelings are hurt, it's always the other person who is out of line. Yet Jesus clearly offended these people and he's never sinned. He's never, he's never sinned. Verse 62 and 63 goes on and says this, what? And if he shall see the son of man ascend up where he was before, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus basically looks at him and says, if you hate what I just taught just a minute ago, you're really going to hate it when you see me leave this place and realize I was right all along, that I was exactly who I said I was. That's, that's really going to bother you. That's really going to drive you crazy when you find out that what I've told you is truth. Verses 64 through 65. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew that from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you, that no man could come unto me except it were given unto him by the Father. He just reminds them that God knows who really belongs to him. And really what's happening here, we talked about it last week, it was to some extent finding out who was fraudulent and who was genuine. And at this point, Jesus ends his message. Here it is, take it or leave it. I'm the bread of life, whether you like it or not, if you're going to, if you're going to have eternal life, you have to partake of me. That's it. Nothing else. This is what you have to do. That is the truth. Whether you like the truth or not, whether you think it's offensive or not, whether it's difficult to swallow or not, it is the truth. Take it or leave it. This is God's process to find out who is genuine and who is fraudulent. Boom. Done. Message over. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They just couldn't handle it. They could not handle the truth. And so they quit. It convicted them, and they didn't like it. And they basically said, we're not sticking around for this anymore. And just like that, just like that, I believe that the crowd went from thousands to twelve. All these people leave, Jesus looks around, and in verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? To the twelve. To the disciples that we know, we read about, the apostles here. What about you guys? Are you gone too? Will you follow the crowd? And I know the way that I'm preaching this message is much different than usual. I'm going to give you some, some thoughts to dwell on before we leave here in just a moment. But as I was thinking about this question that Jesus asked, when, when uh, then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? There are really four questions that came to mind just 
application questions personally for us that came to mind about what it will take for somebody to quit. And I just want you to think about them for just a second. Will you quit when the teaching and preaching gets hard? When I, or maybe some other preacher or teacher, steps on your toes and confronts you, will that be enough to make you quit? Will you quit when the conviction is strong? Because myself included, there are plenty of Christians that, are love, that love to operate in Christendom when it's comfortable. But they don't want to leave their comfort zone. They don't want to be stretched. They don't want to be pushed. They don't want to be moved. They don't want to, they, they don't want to have to do the things that, they've, that they just don't like doing. We don't like, nobody likes to. Nobody, there's a reason, right? There's a reason it's called a comfort zone. <laughs> we're comfortable there. Nobody likes to be pushed outside of that. But if we're going to grow in our faith, it's going to mean some pushing outside of our comfort zone. And we can allow that pushing outside of our comfort zone to make us really really, really grumpy and even bitter. And some people say, you know what? I'm just going to quit because I don't want to get pushed outside of my comfort zone. Will you quit when your material desires are not met? And I begin to think this myself. What if, what if you don't ever get that raise that you've been praying for? What if, again, because this is things the Lord's been dealing with me, what if we never get that building that we've been praying for? What if you do lose your job in the current, current climate? Is that enough to make you quit on God? The fourth question, will you quit when it becomes the popular choice to leave? And by the way, again, I, I think as we look around in our culture that it is becoming the more and more popular choice to walk away from Christendom. And I realize that when people leave, one rarely goes away on their own. When others leave, will you also leave? When it becomes popular to just go somewhere else, will you go? What is it going to take for you to quit? Because Jesus is going to look at these disciples and he's going to tell them, hey, if you thought that message, if you thought the living bread message, having to partake of my body and blood was, was rough, you haven't seen anything yet. And so we come to verses 68 and 69 and Peter speaks up. What a surprise. Of all the people that open his mouth, it's Peter. And oftentimes we know that Peter is the open mouth insert foot guy, but not all the time. Sometimes the things that Peter, Peter says are I mean, right on the mark. When he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus looked at him and said, said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. I mean, Peter nailed, knocked that one out of, the, out of the park. I think Peter does it here as well. Peter kind of stands up, and he's speaking for the 12, because Jesus had just addressed the 12. And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Peter steps up for the 12, and he says, Jesus we have made our choice. We have made a decision. And here it is, Jesus. We aren't going anywhere. Everybody else can abandon. Everybody else can leave. But we're not quitting. And I, I believe there are a few reasons that Peter gives for the choice that he makes here. I believe, first of all, that Peter wanted to stay with the presence of of God. Notice Peter's wording. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, master, you, you're the one. Uh, he, he uses again these words, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, where else could we go that would be in the presence of God? You're God in the flesh. Where else are we going to go? We want to stay with the presence of God. I know this much, wherever the Lord leads me in life, I want to be where God is. And I hope you say that about yourself as well. Wherever God leads me in life, I want to be where God is. To whom shall we go? There's nowhere else for us to go. Jesus, you're here. You're here. And so we want to be where you are. I pray 
that pioneer has the presence of God among us. And I understand if he's living in us and there, you know, there's two or three gathered together, I understand all of those things. But I hope that people will come and be a part of Pioneer because they sense and feel the presence of God amongst his people. I believe, secondly, that Peter chose to stay with the words of life. Look again in that verse there. Then Simon Peter answered the Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You have, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. I, I want to be in a place where God's word is exalted and uplifted and was the authority. I don't want to go anywhere where God is not, not and I don't want to go any place where God's word is not central. And, and, and I hope you understand there's going to be, and I think you all do understand, there will be other places where the kids' programs are better, the music program is better, they have a building to meet in, and all of those things are good things. But of all the things, I want to be a place where God's word is central. It's magnified. It's uplifted. It is central in people's worship. And Peter said, God, I want to be where your presence is, and I want to be where the words of life are. But thirdly, I want you to see this as well, uh, that Peter, uh, Peter chose to stay with the promises of God. Peter chose to stay with the promises of God. Look at verse 69. Peter said this, and we believe, we believe, and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He looks at Jesus and says, I believe and I'm sure that you are who you say you are. Jesus, I believe your words and I also believe your promises. You're trustworthy. Jesus, you've over and over and over again shown yourself to be trustworthy. And so Peter says, listen, we're not quitting because we want to be where the presence of God is and we want to be where the word of God is and we want to be with the, where the promises of God are. And Jesus, we know that they're where you are. So we're not going anywhere else. There's no, better else. There's no other place to go. We're not quitting. We're sticking with you. Can I tell you something? This type of living is not popular today. For many, th for many people, when things get hard, the easiest thing to do is just to walk away. And there are going to be times, Sundays, messages that are preached, songs that are sung, fellowships that are had that will make every single one of us feel all nice and warm and fuzzy on the inside. And then there will be other times of real, genuine, spiritual struggle and hardship. And so when it gets hard... I ask what Jesus asked. Will you also go away? We talked about it before. Jesus kind of looks at all of this, especially the large crowd, and says, if you don't like it, you don't have to be here. I'm not going to force you to be here. And so many didn't want to be there. Most of them left. And now Jesus is left with 12. And look at verses 70 and 71, because it's not done yet. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him being one of the 12. Jesus looks and says, I even understand in this group of everyone that right now says they're going to stick, that not everybody's going to stick. But he wanted them in this moment to think about what was most important. Was what you want to hear most important? Or was the message that Jesus wanted you to hear most important? And so the question we wrestle with and we struggle with this morning is, what will it take for you to quit? What will it take for you to quit on the Lord? What will it take for you to quit on his promises? What will it take for you to quit on his word? What will, you take, what will it take for you to quit on his church? And I don't know about you. And I don't even know what our future holds. But I know this much. I think I'll just stay right here. 
I think I'll just stay right here in the presence of God, with the word of God, and the promises of God. And as we talked about just a few weeks ago, when we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, anything that God has done up to this point has subsided, uh, has been, uh, uh, have been uh, uh, just of the substance of five loaves and two fishes, and whatever he'll do in the past will be five loaves and two fishes. But we'll just keep trusting him. We'll keep focusing on his presence, his word, and his promises. And I hope that we can say along with Peter, Jesus, to whom shall we go? Where else are we going to go? You know what, Jesus, I've just decided to follow you. And as we close out this morning, I ask Terry to come, and you can stay seated right where you are. You don't have to stand up. But I want to sing this song this morning to close out this service. And we, you hear people say it often. I pray, I hope that it isn't just words to music that come out of our mouth, but they're genuine commitments to God this morning that I have decided to follow Jesus. Terry, come and lead us in singing this morning. Let's sing it together. Okay, so I'm, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I was just thinking that I'm very grateful that most of us have made that commitment. And this is a reaffirmation of your commit commitment to follow the Lord. Perhaps there's someone here today who has not yet done that. And we would just want to encourage you in the strongest way to consider what Jesus could mean to you. Let's sing it together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Amen. In your presence, and Lord, to spend time in your word. Lord, we know that, P uh, that Peter got to experience and see some amazing things from you. But he also got to watch you live your life, and he got to sit at your feet and, Lord, experience your presence, see you fulfill your promises, hear the words right from Jesus' mouth. And at the end of that time, in this moment, in this decisive moment, Peter said, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, we'll stay right here with you. Lord, we have the full canon of Scripture. 
your works in times past, how you worked in these people's lives. And Lord, we even have the end of the book. And we see how you're going to operate even in the future, although through a glass, sometimes darkly, we can still see much of your plan. And Lord, I pray that even when things get difficult, and even when things get hard, and even when our hearts hurt, Lord, that we will decide to follow you. That we will not quit. That we will stay along with Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen us and empower us to live that, to believe that, not just today, but every day for your honor and glory, Lord. And we'll thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me say thank you for sticking it out on this hot day. And uh, I'll take the blame for this music here. It's always my responsibility to put the music with the words. And the words are certainly in the program. Uh, but either the wrong music got put in there or no music at all. And that's my fault. So I apologize. Thankfully, it's a song we all know. A song that's easy to sing, uh, fairly easy to sing a cappella. And so just really quickly, just a few things to make you aware of, and uh, many of this is for, for people who are going to be seeing it uh, on uh, online later, possibly. Uh, these are, we always start off with our tithes and offerings, and these are ways for you to give. Many of you have faithfully given uh, by sending it into the church PO box or via the church app. Um, and I'm posting that church address right there, Pioneer Baptist Church PO box 1923, Wilsonville, Oregon. Uh, just to give you an up-to-date uh, offering on August. August budget is 12867 and already for the month to date of August, we're at 13124 uh, Now, again, some of that is from outside churches that are still sending in funds for building fund. And also, just so you know, everybody that I've talked to up to this point uh, has agreed to allow us to keep that in a building fund to set it aside for uh, when the Lord does provide something. So just continue to pray about that. It's It's a couple times a week that Daniel and I We'll, or other people sometimes will interject in as well, but we'll shoot out ideas to each other. What about this place? Or what about this place? Or have we looked into this place? Or let's check out this place. I actually now have complete strangers calling me now, uh, telling me, do you know that this place is for sale? Or how, what, about, what about this place? And so the word's out there. So that's a good thing that people know uh, that we're looking. And again, regular things, uh, five minutes or more with pastor. Uh, I apologize if you were on this week, this, this past week. I, I, in the busyness uh, of Thursday, we, were, we went to the coast with my dad, and I forgot to shoot it on Thursday morning. And it's amazing how much we live by a schedule. I skipped one day, and it led to the second day. And it wasn't until late Friday night that I went, you know what? I didn't do one today either. Oh, man. And so, you know, Saturday, if you watched it on Saturday, I apologize for that. So I, I apologize, but I'll try to keep up with it a little bit better this week. Uh, no midweek regular small group, but we are still doing family nights on Wednesday and uh, those are at 7 p.m. We sent out an email with the Zoom link on that. And then Sunday evening tonight at 6 o'clock, you can catch on YouTube or Facebook. And, uh, and again, for those people that are online, ways for you to contact us there if you need to. There's a website, email, social media. Our phone numbers are on there as well. And uh, beyond that, that's about all we have going on for right now. I do want to say this, because it'll be here before we know it. We are still planning for a fifth anniversary service. You say, Pastor, where's it going to be? What's it going to look like? I don't know. I don't know all of those details. Uh, but we're not going to let a fifth anniversary go out, go by without celebrating it and celebrating it with you. And uh, so we do look forward to that. That is, that is something that's still on our calendar that we're going to find a way to, to make happen and, and, and celebrate that. It's going to be on October 4th, I believe it is, um, would be the first Sunday in October. And so go ahead and write that down and make sure you keep that there. Uh, but beyond that, obviously, with things going on, uh, some of the more details of our schedule. The funny thing is, I don't know if some of you noticed it, uh, August 1st was a Saturday in August, and that's usually when Fun in the Park is. And I texted Daniel on that morning, and I said, today is supposed to be Fun in the Park. And he, for a brief moment, thought that it was still going on, and he forgot it. And he, for a brief moment, freaked out and thought, oh, man, was I supposed to set something up for that? I said, no, 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 it's not going on. And then this past weekend, August 15th, we were supposed to have a big family activity. We were going to invite people from, uh, from Fun in the Park to that big family activity. 
Um, and so some of those things maybe you've kept up with on your calendar that haven't been able to, uh, to take place. But the Lord knows, and uh, I know He has a plan for us and for that, and so we continue to pray and uh, trust His leading in that. Let's stand together this morning, and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much again for this opportunity to meet even on this warm Sunday. And uh, Lord, an opportunity to worship You and to sing of Your goodness and Your greatness, uh, but also the fact that You alone are worthy of our devotion. You alone are worthy of our following. And Lord, may we never quit on that. May we constantly and continually move forward with you, even when it hurts, even when we don't get everything that we had desired, uh, even, Lord, uh, when other people walk away. Lord, may we remain steadfast in our commitment to you. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do through that. We thank you that you are through your son, Jesus Christ, eternally committed to us as well. And Lord, we thank you for the salvation, the eternal life that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning.